A reading from the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, whoever sows sparingly <clears throat> will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each must do as already determined, without sadness or compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Moreover, God is able to make every grace abundant for you, so that in all things, always having all you need, you may have an abundance for every good work. As it is written, he scatters abroad, he gives to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. The one who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed and increase the harvest of your righteousness. Verbum Domini.
loves me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life, says the Lord. Alleluia. Dominus Vobiscum, et Spiritus Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Ioanne, Gloria Jesus said to his disciples, Amen, Amen, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains just a grain of wheat. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. Whoever lo loves his life will loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will preserve it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there also will my servant be. The Father will honor whoever serves me. Bebum Domini. Now, as we observe the life and heroic deeds of the deacon St. Lawrence today, we reflect in particular on an essential aspect of the order of deacon, and that's service. Now, this includes, of course, the service of God in the liturgy and also service to the church. And as the Baltimore Catechism teaches us, God made man to love him, to know him, to love him, and to serve him in this world, and to be happy with him forever in heaven. So we can learn <clears throat> some things about service from our saint today, from St. Lawrence, that we can try to put into practice in our own lives. Now, there is very little information that is available for St. Lawrence. We know that he was one of seven deacons who served the church at Rome during the pontificate of Pope St. Sixtus II, and that he was martyred in the year 258. And Lawrence, like other deacons in the ancient church, worked very closely with the local bishop, who in this case happened to be the Bishop of Rome, the Pope. Now, according to Bert Gezi, who is the author of Voices of the Saints, Lawrence was charged with caring for the church's goods and almsgiving, which he administered generously. An ancient Christian popular tradition recalls that the saint wept as Pope Sixtus was being led to execution because he wanted to accompany the Holy Father. He was so close to him. And Pope Sixtus assured Lawrence that he would join him three days later. And this prophecy excited Lawrence so much that he disposed of all the money and goods that he could to the poor. Now his opportunity for martyrdom indeed came when the prefect of Rome gave Lawrence three days to gather together the treasures of the church and to bring them to him. And so Lawrence went and he gathered all the poor, the diseased, and the crippled whom he had served as a deacon. And then he brought them before the prefect saying that these people are the treasure of the church. So the prefect, of course, was not humored by this, and he condemned Lawrence to a slow and horrific death by grilling him alive. Now, as the tradition tells us, as St. Lawrence was being roasted, he said in jest, you can turn my body over now, one side is broiled enough. And then before he died, he said, it is cooked enough, you may eat. Now, I don't think that this account, of course, is meant to make light of his suffering 
or the suffering of his martyrdom, but rather it is meant to encourage us in the face of persecution. Of course, it takes a, a man of great faith and love to be able to crack jokes in the midst of his own suffering. Now, as a deacon, Lawrence rendered the ultimate diaconal service by giving his life for the people he served. He was, of course, generous with the church's goods, but he was also generous with the gift of his own life. The readings for the Mass today have, under, have this underlying theme of service and generosity, and these are essential aspects of the di diaconate. Now, the very word service is a translation of the Greek word diakonia. And that from this word diakonia, you can hear how we get the, the English word, we derive the English word deacon. And in the early church, similar to today, the bishop alone laid his hands upon the man's head during ordination as a sign that the deacon is directly under the service of the bishop. Now, in priestly, in the rite of priestly ordination, on the other hand, we have during this ordination, the bishop and all of the concelebrating priests lay their hands on the newly ordained in order to show the character or manifest the character of priestly brotherhood within the diocese. Now, furthermore, the prayer of consecration during the rite of ordination of diaconate ordination also has a reference to imitating the life of Christ who came not to be served, but to serve. So service is an essential element of diaconal ministry. Now at my own diaconate ordination, Bishop Baker said the following during his homily. He said, no one is ordained a priest in the Catholic church who does not pass through the diaconate first. It is the church's way of highlighting the critical importance of service as a key to all, all ministry, including the priesthood. A deacon is to follow the pattern of Jesus who came among us not to be served, but to serve. So in other words, even when a deacon is ordained to the priesthood, the newly ordained priest does not lay aside this call to service but now he serves in a new capacity as a priest who acts, as we say, in persona Christi capitis, in the person of Christ the head. So the priest is configured to Christ the high priest, and he is empowered to offer the holy sacrifice of the mass in union with Christ. So the diaconate is primarily ordered to the service of the liturgy. And as the Catechism of the Catholic Church teaches, a deacon assists bishops and priests in the celebration of the divine mysteries, above all the Eucharist, in a distri distribution of Holy Communion, in assisting at and blessing marriages, in the proclamation of the gospel and preaching, in presiding over funerals, and in dedicating themselves to the various ministries of the church, of the ministries of charity. Then as a deacon, St. Lawrence assisted the bishop in, and of course in his case the Pope, by faithfully fulfilling these various functions in the church. He fulfilled his calling to give of himself in service to Christ and his church. Now in the <clears throat> second reading from the second letter of the Corinthians, that was our first reading today, St. Paul touches on sowing and reaping bountifully. And he also talks about the nature of generosity and at one point in the reading, he says, each must do as already determined. And this sentence can also be translated, each must choose for him or herself from the heart. And then he goes on to say, God, for God loves a cheerful giver, or God loves a gracious giver. That's another way you can understand that. So generosity primarily flows freely and graciously from the heart and not from a feeling of compulsion or from a mere sense of obligation. That's how we are cheerful givers. It's free and gracious. And in order to imitate the generosity of St. Lawrence, we ought to pray, of course, for the, the grace of conversion in our own hearts, 
that our hearts may be made more like the servant heart of Christ. And then, of course, we must put this virtue of generosity into practice so that it may grow in our hearts. And of course, like I said, virtue requires practice in order to grow. Now, St. Lawrence's generosity prepared him to make the ultimate contribution of his life for the sake of his people. Now, we have all likely heard the, the quote from Tertullian, the blood of martyrs is the seed of the church. Now, this word martyr itself means witness. And in a broad sense, anyone who witnesses to the truth of Jesus Christ and the gospel is a martyr. So each one of us is called to be a martyr by the daily witness of our Christian faith, hope, and charity. However, the word martyr is most appropriately applied to those saints who have given the ultimate witness to the truth. In giving their lives, the martyrs teach us that defending the truth of the gospel is more important than the preservation of their own earthly life. Their sacrifice is a participation in Christ's sacrifice on the cross, who gave his life for us. Jesus says in the gospel today, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains just a grain of wheat. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. So it is through the shedding of the blood of the martyrs in union with Christ's sacrifice that has enabled the church to, to spread throughout the world and to endure for almost 2,000 years. And in fact, the martyrdom or the witness of St. Lawrence has had such a lasting impact on the church that his name is even included in the list of blessed apostles and martyrs in the first Eucharistic prayer uh, that we pray at the liturgy, the Roman canon. The sacrifice and continued prayers of these apostles and martyrs facilitate the, perfect, the, the protection and the growth of the universal church. Now, most of us are aware of the church's teaching that all of the faithful share in the common priesthood of Christ by virtue of baptism. And of course, this is taught in the document of the Second Vatican Council, Lumen Gentium. But the catechism describes the difference between the common and the ministerial priesthood. It says, while the common priesthood of the faithful is exercised by the unfolding of baptismal grace, that is a life of faith, hope, and charity, a life according to the spirit, the ministerial priesthood is at the service of the common priesthood. So in other words, the common priesthood of the faithful is primarily lived out by assenting to the fullness of divine revelation by living out our faith as it comes to us through sacred scripture, sacred tradition, and church teaching. And it's also lived out by doing works of charity. And this is how we love God and our neighbor. Now remember that I said earlier in the homily that upon ordination, priests still retain their call to diaconal service. And in a similar way, the common priesthood of the faithful also includes, in a sense, a call to a, a sort of common diaconate of the faithful, in the sense that all the faithful are called to serve. And this service can, of course, take many forms for the, the lay faithful. The faithful can serve in a way that, of course, is appropriate, and this is our primary calling to our state and life, we're called to holiness, to live holiness in our particular state in life. But they can also serve through their profession or through um, career. They can serve in various lay apostolates, such as the Legion of Mary. Uh, spouses are called to serve each other for the good of their marriage and for the good of each other and for the good of their children. And children are called to serve their parents by honoring and obeying them. Single people are called to serve the church in whatever way they can. Perhaps it could be through various, the various ministries available in the church, RCIA, religious education, ministry to the poor, ministry to their own families, assistance with the litur liturgy, whether being a lector or a cantor or a server or et cetera. And then those who are homebound 
or unable to partake in active ministry, such as many of our viewers of the network, they are called to serve by offering their prayers and sacrifices for the good of the church. So every baptized member of the church can play their part in building up the body of Christ and in bringing more and more souls to Christ. And in this way, we, we participate in the diaconia, the service of Christ, who came not to be served, but to serve. And finally, I wanted to conclude with the simple and yet inspiring words of St. Augustine. He says, Lawrence was a deacon of the Church of Rome. There he ministered the sacred blood of Christ. There, for the sake of Christ's name, he poured out his own blood. In his life, he loved Christ. In his death, he followed in his footsteps. Brothers and sisters, we too must imitate Christ if we truly love him. <laughs>